first of all, thank you very much for having me. And uh, while on my way to the car, I was thinking, how do I make these 20 minutes useful for everybody here in the audience, right? So that you walk away with something meaningful. So the topic that I have been given is the future of payments. So we will not skim the surface. We'll deep down a little bit, understand, and maybe there are a few nuggets that you can take from uh, the discussion we are going to have in the next 15 minutes, and then we'll do five minutes of Q&A. If you have a question, happy to answer it for you, right? Uh, so today's payments, we are going to look at from two perspectives. We'll look at from a Naveen's perspective, who's an adult, right? And I also want to take you to the world of my son, who's 15 years old, right? And you want to look at payment from his perspective as well, right? So this gives you two views. So who wants to be 15 again? Right, so let's try that, how it works, okay? Uh, so let's think about payments first. Um, fundamentally, a payment is needed to complete any transaction. Doesn't matter, it's a metaverse or a physical world. Uh, 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 when something moves from point A to B, it could be an idea, it could be a digital good, it could be a physical good. It's not complete till actually there is a return payment on the back, right? A person gives something to, from, moves from A to B, the payment needs to come from B to A for the transaction to get completed, right? So underlying any transaction, any system that runs in the world, a payment needs to be there, right? So, so the payment's very important, right? A payment has got two parts. So again, we are not going to skim the surface, we're going to come a little bit deeper, right? So one is the messaging layer, right? Whereby you're just telling the person, I have intention to pay you or I want to pay you. And then the second part is the settlement part or the liquidity part where actually you move value from point A to point B, right? So if you think of the Swift world, uh, it is something called the MT-103, or in an API, you send a message from an organization A to organization B that here's the detail of the payment, I want to credit this account. And then there is an MT-202, right? Or the transfer of value from point A to point B, which means actually you take something which is accepted as a value by both a and B, and you deduct the ledger of A, and you add to the ledger of B, right? I mean, this needs to happen. That's the only way the settlement gets completed, and then you have a complete payment, right? So payment always has two parts. And that's the reason blockchain becomes very relevant and important, because the beauty of blockchain is that it brings both these two things together. So it brings the messaging layer, so the person A knows that the person B is getting paid, and through tokenization, it's also able to move value from A to B. And because these things are together, it creates the magic that you see in the world of cryptos or you see in the world of blockchain, right? But crypto or blockchain would not be relevant for payments if there is something very, very significant would not have been there. Can somebody guess what it is, which is not there in the, in the normal payments world, but is there in the crypto world? Just guess. I mean, and it's very, very fundamental part of the plumbing, without which None of the payments in the crypto would work as efficiently the way it works today. It may be USDC, it could be anybody, yes? Uh, no, not miners, right? So I'll give a, I mean, in, in terms of speed, I'll give you an example. It's 24 seven trading, right? So a lot of us in a crypto world, we assume, ah, yeah, you know what, we have got 24 seven trading, so what, right? Uh, a Bitcoin or Ethereum or an XRP is trading in Japan, is trading in the US, is trading in Hong Kong, it's trading in Malta simultaneously. But this 24 7 trading is very fundamental because all the other markets in the world, it may be a gold market, it may be a US dollar market, it may be the Fed's wire, they don't operate 24 7. And because they don't operate 24 7, it creates a huge amount of inefficiency, right? And it is this inefficiency that this blockchain and crypto is solving for by 24 7 trading. Had this 24 7 trading not been there, we would have been exactly the same in the payments world the way we are today. It wouldn't have made any difference, right? So that is equally fundamental as the technology innovation within the blockchain, right? I want you to understand this because this 24-7 trading creates a platform for a lot of other innovations to happen, right? And, and that is quite central. So when you think about blockchain, when you think about value getting transferred, messaging, or settlement. It's this 24-7 trading that gives it the velocity for new innovations to come through. If it wasn't there, then it'll look like our traditional world in which we live today, right? So, so th that's, that's one part I wanted to convey, right? The second part that I want to convey to you is in the future of payments, like what had happened in the case of internet or an email. So earlier we used to have post office, right? We would write a letter 
and our, when we send a letter within, within the UAE, it reach in one day, and maybe it cost one dirham, and then we'll send a letter to the US, it'll cost us five US dollars, right, so, or, or whatever the price may be, right? But then came email, and in email, it did not matter. We may be sitting next to each other, or we, we, I would be sending an email to somebody in America. I could send a million emails to you, or I could send you one email. It conveyed the same content, that is the emotion that is there in the letter, or the content that is there in the letter, in the form of an email. And I could do it a million times over, I can distribute it a million times over, right? So it essentially removed the concept of an uh, international post office or sending, a, sending information internationally or domestically. Exactly the same thing is going to happen in the payments as well. So this concept that we have, that I'm going to pay you internationally or I'm going to pay you here locally, this will go away. It will essentially one size fits all. I'm making a payment to anybody in the world, and it doesn't matter if it's a domestic or international payment. And of course, both the sides will be KYC'd. Say, for example, if you're sending USDC to somebody, again, the same concept, you could be sitting here next to me, or you could be sitting in Malta, it doesn't matter, and I'm able to transfer USDC, for example, one wallet to another, or XRP from one wallet to another. It really doesn't matter, right? So this concept of domestic and international payments will essentially become to zero, exactly what happened in the case of the internet. Again, this is important because on the top of it, you would be able to build new ecosystems, new, uh, what do you call it, break down the boundaries that exist in the traditional world which are not be relevant in the new world. Right? So that's, a, that's the second part that's relevant, right? The third part that is relevant is um, today, the cost of the payment we are talking about, say for example, in, within, the, within uh, UAE, when you send a payment, it costs you five dirhams. So that's roughly about one US dollars, right? When you, when you send a buyer transfer, it'll cost you maybe 40 US dollars or 50 US dollars, right? In the case of internet, exactly the same thing used to happen with post offices, where to send a letter will cost you $2, $3, and things like those, right? But then came the email, and the cost of sending information or an email is almost zero. Similarly, the cost of payment will almost tends towards zero, but the volume of payments will become, I don't even, can't even hazard a guess how many times over and over, and every year it will go, it'll increase at an exponential rate. So you can think about it almost in 1998, you're sitting here and then you're saying, hey, you know what, maybe people will send 10 million emails a day, right? And then you come in 2001, then you say, hey, 10 million, that was grossly small number, right? And then you say, oh, maybe people will send a billion emails a day uh, or billion messages a day. You look at it two or three years later, you say, billion, come on, it got to be a joke, right? So this will move exponentially and the cost of the payment itself will almost tend to zero, right? So again, these three things put together, right? Um, uh, where, where in the blockchain, the value can move along with the message. There is 24-7 trading, which means there is 24-7 liquidity, there is 24-7 movement of value on both the sides. Uh, the, the cost of the payment will also become, almost become zero, and the difference between a domestic and international payment will essentially go away, right? So now it gives you a level playing field to say, if you guys are all entrepreneurs in the room, what new business model that you can create whereby you can create value or you can go after six billion users or seven billion users who are now waiting for you with this new infrastructure that is being available. Right? So I hope this gives you a little bit of context because as you think about new business models, these are some of the things that are very relevant. Right? Most of the innovation in payments that have has happened has happened at the cosmetic level. A cooler app, yes, somebody can do reconciliation a little bit better, somebody can move the payment a little bit faster, but it's the 24-7 trading and the in instant settlement on the blockchain that is a game changer. So payments through cryptos or in some form of tokenization uh, will, is a game changer, right? The other thing as in, in terms of parallel that is happening is almost anything of value in the world possibly will be tokenized, right? The hotel that we are staying in, um, the, 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 of course, the dirhams that we have in our pocket, the US dollar that we have in our pocket will all get tokenized. And that tokenization essentially then lends to this movement of value a lot more quickly. So again, something for you to think about in terms of future payments and what business model that we want to participate in, either as an as a observer, as an entrepreneur, uh, as a corporate, as an investor, and whatever you may choose, right? Now, then the question essentially becomes is, who will benefit? So what's the big deal? Yeah, payments is faster, settlement is this way, international payments are 
um, same as domestic payments and we can do million payments a, a minute, so what? So who will benefit? Right? Because if nobody benefits, why do it? So I'm guessing no benefits. Right? So the biggest benefit, I mean, I'm, I'm taking at the 10,000 feet level, is the GDP of the country. Right? As you increase the velocity of money, right, automatically you will be able to get higher growth rates. So a very simple example I'll take. So let's assume today you, you invoice your clients on a 30-day payment term. So she's selling, um, um, uh, say, for example, goods on the Internet, and her clients pay her in 30 days, right? And by the time you actually receive the payment, it's 33 days. That means you need three days of extra working capital because you're waiting for money to essentially come to you. Now, let's assume she invoices on, in invoices on 30 day terms and she gets the money on 30 days. That means you need three days less of working capital. If you look on a yearly basis, you need 36 less days of working capital, right? If you add these 36 days within your balance sheet, you get 10% extra sales because you now know, don't need to account for this particular capital. So how many central bankers will give their right arm to get 10% more growth within their economy without doing anything? Right? And that's the reason this will succeed. This will succeed at an individual level, at a personal level, it'll succeed at a corporate level, and it'll succeed at the GDP or the economy level, economy level. Because through the velocity of money, you will be able to great, get greater output and you will be able to get greater growth. And that's the reason lots of people will be very interested in that. Right? So then the question becomes, what are some of the use cases that will catch on this fast? So of course, I don't know. It'll be the, for the entrepreneurs to decide what use cases that they will essentially build on, uh, which will utilize these things. But three use cases come like very strongly in front of my mind. So first, first use case is gaming, and that's where I want to take you to my my son's um, son's insight. So of course, I mean, like a lot of you, he plays Roblox. He loves it, and his biggest problem is that today he's not able to do trading between two games. So he has got a skin. He wants to exchange it for a sword. Like when I was young, when I was 15, maybe the coolest thing to impress of the, somebody of the opposite sex was if I have a guitar or if I could so help her with a maths problem. But for my son, to impress her, he needs to impress her in the game, right? So then that means you need to be cool. You should be able to move things from one game to another. You should be able to gift her things, right? So, so then you can get some dating action in life. Otherwise, it, it's not going anywhere. So it's super important, right? So from his point of view, it's very important that he's able to trade within the game, he's able to liquidate, buy what he has earned in the game, and convert into an ice cream, and convert that AED that he has into any kind of a gaming asset. And that's the reason, because there are about 3 billion casual gamers around the world, which either on the phone or on the, on the, on, on the, on the, on the, on the video or on the screen, that they are going to drive this new economy. The consumers are essentially hungry in some way to be able to create monetization within the game, outside the game, interoperability between two games, and hence this economy needs to succeed. And the payment system 24-7, no cross-border, um, I mean, essentially, uh, uh, no difference between domestic and cross-border will be the platform that essentially enables this to happen, right? The second thing that we should talk about is micropayments. So let's look at somebody like FT.com or Wall Street Journal or any of the newspapers that you subscribe. Each one of them is subscription-based, right? So it costs you maybe $60 for subscription. But maybe he wants to read only one article, right? He doesn't want to go and read the whole newspaper. So if you want to read just one article, you say, I'm ready to pay 10 cents for it. And there are probably hundreds of millions of users who just want to read one article and are ready to pay 10 cents. But there is no payment system in the world today which can take a 10 cent payment from global citizens across the world and give it to FT or give it to Wall Street Journal. FT loses sales, you lose content, everybody loses. And again, this is a problem in terms of the future of payments that will get solved because at a negligible cost of payment, this 10 cent payments becomes important. FT wins because it's able to collect millions of dollars from people around the world. Right? So the second thing would be micropayments, which will, which will essentially help monetization of a lot of content or e-commerce or goods at, at a very low value level, right? Like a 10 cent level, 50 cents, $1, and that kind of stuff. But the numbers will be huge. So what people will lose in the actual uh, per unit transaction, lose is not the right word, but in the small per unit transaction, but the volume will be very huge, right? So the third thing that we should talk about is remittances. Clearly, I mean, that's a play which Ripple has, where um, they will be 
A is sending money to B, and today they're having a 7% friction. So on an average, if you send $200 from country A to country B, you only receive $186. 7% of it gets taken away uh, in the friction that essentially involved. That is FX, that is fee, uh, that is a transaction fee, and, and uh, third is the float, or the working capital that you essentially need to pay for. And that will essentially decline dramatically, and we are, of course, big time working on it to make sure that people don't lose this 7% every time money moves cross-border. And fundamentally, the way it'll work is that the native currencies, or, or it could be a CBDC, it doesn't matter, will get converted into some kind of bridge currency, and the bridge currency will get converted into the home currency. So in case of uh, in, in, for example, in our solution, what happens is GBP gets converted to XRP, XRP gets converted to Philippines Peso, and within 30 seconds, everybody goes home. There is no need for Nostra accounts, there is no need for hidden capital, and the cost of transaction is much, much lower. I'll pause here, because I promised I'll take a few questions. Anybody, anything that I can answer for you? From what I understand, Ripple is the underlying infrastructure layer through which money is transferred from, I mean, across borders, right? Where is the XRP bit coming? Is this, yeah. a, this a token? So Ripple is a software. So nothing else. Ripple is a software which essentially enables this infrastructure to happen. XRP is trading freely in, a, in say, A exchange in the UK where GBP to XRP is getting traded, say, for example, $50 million a day, right? Similarly, there is an exchange in Philippines that is trading... XRP to Philippine peso, 50 million US dollars equivalent a day. So what we are doing is we are bringing two, these two order books together, and when you're sending a remittance from GBP to Philippines peso, we are with the, bringing these two order books together, we are transferring GBP, using XRP as a bridge within two seconds itself, and converting that to Philippines peso and doing the payout, right? And it's a software that essentially brings every, everybody together. XRP is itself trading independently of each other in these two order books. Thousands of people, they're trading it for their own purpose. No, this is fully compliant because what we do is we work with uh, regulated institutions only on both the sides, and these are fully approved uh, transactions. So the way it would work in traditional world would be GBP to US dollars to Philippines peso. In this case, it's moved from GBP to XRP to Philippines peso. How is this different from, let's say, layer two of Bitcoin, like the, the Lightning Network or something? Is that like trying to do the same thing? Yeah. I, I mean, there are a number of people who are trying to do it. We have built a system at scale which essentially works. It's aggregated. We work with regulated financial institutions. So, yes. Others? Yeah. yeah Please. Uh, I think maybe uh, it's uh, somewhat answered the question, right? Uh, but in terms of the risk, looking at it from the risk angle, right? So who takes the risk uh, from a customer's perspective, onboarding, KYC, stuff like that? Uh, I think regulation was mentioned. And the, and the second thing is the exchange, the currency risk, right? Uh, on both sides, who, yeah. who, who takes those, those risks? Right? So, so for example, in our case, we work only with regulated financial institutions, so every customer is fully KYC'd and AML, right? Every transaction is like it happens in the traditional world. Say, for example, you, I mean, previously you're a customer of MoneyGram or you're a customer of a ZMO, you're a customer of one of our, and these are regulated financial institutions. First, they will say, is, are you the right person? Is this transaction for the right purpose? And then only the transaction will go through. And the, the, uh, the exchanges are already trading the digital asset 24-7, 365 days a year. So it's, a, it's price transparency that's there, and all you're doing is you're using the same modus operandi to make the transaction or transfer of value from a country A to country B. Uh, so, so firstly, this is significantly cheaper, or this is a significant innovation from versus what is happening today. Right? So if you look at in the existing system, it is 7%, right? So what we truly believe is if you take out the cost of liquidity, which is the largest portion of this 7%, and you make it almost zero, these costs are going to go down directly, right? It's exactly the same thing post offices asked. What's the incentive of email? Hello? Please. Oh, sorry. Yes, please go ahead. Whoever has Help. the mic, and then I'll come to you. Yes. Excuse me? Yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, two questions. Uh, Could you ask one, and then we'll go to this lady? Yeah, yes. Okay. Uh, unlike most of other cryptos, I read some reports that. Uh, Ripple is not decentralized. It is centralized. So what's your take on that? Yeah, so I can, I can get into the debate, but what I wanted to say is customers don't care. 
you give them something of value, something that makes a step change in their experience and in their lives, right? You have delivered it. So yes, we can get into the philosophical debate of centralized versus decentralization, but as a, as a customer, if I'm delivering value to you, I'm changing your life in a meaningful way, do you care? Right? I mean, apologies, I don't mean it flippantly. I hope everybody understands that. But what customers care about is, are you delivering significant value and are you changing your my life in a meaningful way? And I can assure you, we are doing that every day. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, great. Great session. Uh, my name is Anju, and I'm from Ultimate Access, an education provider. And we provide uh, online education across the world. So when it comes to students, I want to find out they have difficulties in making payments, especially from different parts of the world. Sure. Are you accepting payments from any part of the world? Yeah, yeah. So we enable num um, coming here, we enable number of our customers who are in the student payment business, right? And they are exactly doing that. They're helping universities because one of the problems universities have is a lot of time they don't get the exact payment, right? And that's what they wanted for the university fee. And our customers are like in Australia, we have already opened Australia, where FlashFX, one of our customers is doing exactly the same thing. Right, great. And micropayments, do you accept that? Uh, we enable micropayments, so there's a company called Coil, C-O-I-L, you can look them up. They essentially enable micropayments on the internet today. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, I have to go at zero, but I'll be at the back. We'll be happy to speak to you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you.